Okay, starting recording. Tuesday, this is November 14 meeting. OSC dev team here. So we've got a few things on agenda. Um, there's a couple of other channels besides this working channel, which is on the OSC dev team. There's the OSC developer Slack channel, and that is for uh, the work on the OSC developer workbench. The actually the D3D workbench as well. So so Lex and Oliver are working there, and also the robotic tractor. If you look at the open source robotic tractor page on the wiki, there's a link there. Uh, let me just put that in there for anyone who wants to view that. There's a team led by Matt Droder, who's where we're working on a GPS addition to the current MicroTrack build, which is very exciting, and uh, that's moving forward, where we have. Uh, some of the software, the hardware, and also a robotic simulation using uh, what's called Gazebo. It's a simulation software that that models how the tractor is actually going to move based on its code. So this is part of the Ross Robotic Operating System project, and then Matt is with R Ross Agriculture, whose mission is to empower farmers with open source tools, advanced tools, robotic tools. Okay, so let's talk about first thing today since Ahmed showed up. Uh, we are going to talk about the 3D printer and a build that's potentially happening in Saudi Arabia, so we're still working on that. So, uh, Ahmed, would you give us an update of what, what's happened so far and, and a potential, like, are you guys looking at a potential date yet, or, or that's still up in the air? Uh, no, it's uh, in the middle of February, as planned, and that's why uh, we need to finish it uh, within uh -huh. this week to confirm to stop the the other process for creating the place and the yeah the media advertising, you know. Yeah. So so what's the what's the date that you guys are looking at? Again. Sorry. What is what is the date for the event for the Saudi build? In the middle of February. Middle of February. Inshallah. Yeah. Uh. So you Which got two and a half months. And where is that going to be? Yeah. In the Khobar first one. In the Khobar in the first place. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe we'll go to the in other two places like Riyadh and uh, Jeddah mm -hmm. uh, or just Riyadh. Where okay. it's not confirmed on film. But 100 percent is Khobar in the first one. Okay. How do you spell Khobar? Khobar? A L K H O La Khobar, okay. La Khobar, okay. Um, excellent. So, what kind of a, do you have a venue? Again? Do you have a venue? Uh, I mean, <laughs> this Place. Place. It was me right now. Uh, one moment. No, as far as the place for the event, uh, where is that? Hello, Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Hello! Hi. Hi Martian! Hey, how are you? Uh, good to see you. How are you doing? It's been a long while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad the Saudi Saudi planning is moving forward. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of Finally, different things. Finally, we were waiting uh, for our hero to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so he's back now. And we're waiting actually now. I'm still hesitant because of the uh, pilots, as you said. Yeah, I fully agree with your uh, thoughts. As, you were, as we were speaking earlier, uh, uh, unless we have an actual working prototype, uh, announcing or preparing for anything regarding the workshop is, is not easy. Right. And unfortunately, the distance is far. Otherwise, I'm sure maybe uh, if one of us could reach the other, if we came to you or you came to us, we would have built it much faster. I was, I was, I was this close to say to Ahmed, go to the U.S. and build it with Martin and come back. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, it's still but an option yeah, if you want to do it. <clears throat> it's yeah, still an option if you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Program so far, I don't know, maybe Ahmed uh, shared with you that the tentative dates we, we chose uh, mid feb It's actually ideal based on uh, students' feedback. They are uh, our our lead, uh, our, our, our pilot community. They're a group of engineers who are going to be coming back after the vacation. And they're, they're, they're very active on the social media, on, on, on engineering. Um, actually, I have a group in Riyadh, which Ahmed mm -hmm. was mentioning. Uh, maybe I'll tell you about it. It's Talal. 
they're thinking of engaging uh, OSE in in uh, in uh, a more uh, what do you call it? Uh, more way. long term. Yeah. They wanted to have uh, with you a discussion uh, on how can we make um, a kind of collaboration between the university and OSE in states, so we can send some students over for maybe a couple of weeks to be interns there with you. I think you have such programs, right? Well, right now. We don't for the short-term ones, but we are developing one that will be actually three months. But that would start, not yet, that would be more like September of next year. Something like this. Uh, September next year, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what great. we're looking at. Yeah. It's great. But as far as visiting, I mean, the short-term opportunities are maybe, you know, like a, around a workshop, if they want to get a, get a sense of what the events look like, attend a workshop and, you know, a couple of days before that or something like that would be good. So, you know, like a four-day four day trip would be good, you know, five-day, something like that. Um, sure, sure. Yeah. No, I mean, that would be good. What, what yeah, university they, is that? They are actually the, the, the engineering, um, what do you call it, engineering club, engineering community, engineering council, something of the student council for engineering. And they're, they're actually really uh, thinking of, uh, as I said, involving it in, 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 a, in, a, in an internship program. Like they come for a couple of months or so. Yeah. As you were saying, to attend yep. the hands on. So I was I was telling them let's okay let's let's discuss this with March and after we we see how the workshop will go. Yep. Yeah. So do you have a venue for the workshop? Place. Yes. We and have two places. One in Hobar here. I think I sent you the email of the location earlier. It's Hobar. It's on the east coast. It's very close to uh, four countries. So Kuwait, Bahrain. Qatar and UAE, they're very close to us. Uh -huh. So any impact we do here is going to be uh, serving not only Saudi Arabia, but we call it the Gulf region. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and this is the starting uh, event in Hobart. Um, maybe we can share with you some photos or a video of the place later on. It's, it's already opened. We're, we're finishing furnishing and uh, setting it up. We're putting some hard uh, tables. We have uh, like 11, 13 uh, existing uh, 3D printers. We have five laser cutters. It's a good place. It's bright up, bright up. As in, in, yeah, if, if you Google it, you'll find it. It's bright up. It's uh -huh. registered as a Fab Lab, officially on the Fab Lab community. If you see it, you'll find bright up in Khobar. It's in Rashid Mall. And the venue in Riyadh is in the university itself. It's called Al Faisal University. A L F A I S A L Al Faisal University one of the new private uh, universities. Uh, so the community there in Riyadh is uh, easily secured. We, we can have 100 uh, registrants and uh, we can have as well the um, uh, the venue is fair. The brewery will be wonderful for us as well. The weather will be great. But so far, as I said, we're, we're starting with, what we're having solid is the um, event of Khobar. This is fully in our house. The Faisal University, they asked me for um, a write-up, a, a proposal, for like a small presentation of the 3D printed workshop. What would it contain? What's the value for it, etc. Mm -hmm. I remember I told you about it earlier and you said it's easy. We can work on something together. Mm -hmm. And maybe I will work on the um, some localizing it and adding the Arabic version of it and sharing it with them. Yeah. So they can, our uh, hosts, and help with uh, sponsoring chairs for students who are becoming uh, from outside the university. Okay. I was, I was saying a ratio of 20% to be from outside the university. So we make this kind of uh, diversity, as, as we were talking earlier. Yeah, yeah. Good place to start, like as far as the publicity for that. I mean, start with announcement that we have up and start pulling information from that and continue for whatever else you need from that point yes yeah okay so what next so should we go what else I don't know I, 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 uh, you, I, I sorry to interrupt you and Ahmed I was just coming to say hi yep and we'll are you, and leave you now with that. where are you right now is that uh, that's not the hacker space itself are you uh, uh, no, we're right in up. our office. It's, it's a small place where we uh, may give you a. Uh, uh, this is our small hub place where we sit and work. 
Is uh, this a lacquer bar? This is our 3D printer new frame. Whoa, look at uh, that. Yeah, that is the, uh, this is the 3D printer which we are using to print the actual parts. You can see the picture clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And there is the frame of, uh, that's the purple one. Yep. That's the, the regular, uh, the, the normal one. Is this uh, the office as that's part of the hacker space in La Hobart? or? Oh, this is this is our 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 uh, crash zone. It's our office where we do the planning. Okay, show me a show. Take a look at the printer again. Uh, sh put a put the camera on the printer again. I want to see what you've got there. Some of the details. Yeah, so you got the bolts through the frame. That's square tubing. Of a frame. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to make sure to the alignment, because in our test in the first time the alignment was not like that pretty good, and uh, there was a lot of sounds. That's why I changed it to the to this frame to make sure from the alignment. And yeah. The bolting uh, also is better than uh, magnetic electric if somehow is uh, pulling down, and it's very hard to yeah to do with uh, less pieces. Uh, that's why I move on on uh, this proposal. It's it's uh, not uh, finalized. I finalize it tomorrow morning, inshallah. Uh, after the editing the build, yeah, final build, and I give you the the all dimensions. Okay. Yep. Uh, how are you sticking? How are you putting the metal pieces together? Yeah. Are you? Yes. How are you putting? How are you assembling the metal pieces together? The white frame. Uh, how? Rivet. Oh, yeah. oh I see. Rivets. rivets. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Is it pretty efficient to do a riveted frame? Pretty uh, fast? Yeah. Yes. I can, uh, I can, uh, go down the, the, the ground and it's, it's too strong. Uh, efficiency? Uh, it depends on the water stuff. If it's cutting and already done, it will not take more than uh, one hour to assemble the, the whole thing. And then, how are you cutting it? How are you cutting the frame? And the grinder. Just grinder? Okay. Yeah. What's the gauge of the, the steel? Is it like... Uh, not steel, port, it's aluminum. Uh, aluminum. What is it like? In the kitchen. 14 gauge? Or 16 gauge? What's no, the... no, no, it's, it's an aluminium one. It's, uh, you know, uh, I can't, uh, it's, uh, like in our kitchens and our windows. Uh, it's like this frame. It's aluminum, it's not metal. Right, right, so but what's the, what's the thickness of that steel? Uh, it's about uh, one milli. One millimeter? Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe no. one. Uh, no, it's about... Uh, Half millimeter. Yes. Half a millimeter. I can make it. I can push it now. It's a half milli square cube, but it's still too strong. It's come come to come to two inch. Yeah, uh, four uh, four uh, forty centimeter. Four millimeter. 40, or four millimeter. Forty by forty mm. Yeah. Huh. It's about. I think it says uh, one half I gauge. Think you can cut. It. Oh, by the way, by the way, if you have a hacksaw and they are not uh, a good cutter, you can cut it easily. So and is it? Uh, you don't have to go to the workshop to do. It. Is it? Is it made of tubing or is it angles? It's tubing, right? It's tubing uh, tube. riveted together. That's interesting, huh? But how do you get it so square? If it's because you, you got to match, you got to make every side very square. Again. Well, how do you make it um, nice and square? Do you use any nice jig? I, I, for me, I use the grinder. But to align it, how do you align it to be nice and square? I, how I can guarantee that? Yeah. It's about the cutting. Okay. Yeah, it's about the cutting itself. It, you, you, you just uh, put the... the the, uh, just the, the cube or the cube on the place and mark it mm -hmm. just, uh, and just like uh, 
the end stopper for it and start cutting tuck 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 with the end stopper it will guarantee that all the parts will be in the same but then you have to leave a tab for the rivet to go in right so you cut like a notch or something uh yeah there is two types i make it uh, like uh, uh 45 degree cutting yeah. Yeah. some places yeah and uh, it's not a big issue maybe i can get uh, i can do it uh, like you say uh, a full square also it's not a big issue for me uh -huh. but uh, i don't know the other people right right well, I mean, just I'm thinking about the workshop. I mean, that is, I, I can tell you, it's not completely entry level to do a frame like this. How are we yeah. going to do that for the workshop? Are we going to pre-cut all the frames? Yes, maybe. Why not? Yeah, I mean, we'd have to, we'd really have to do that because that's, I could tell you that that's not going to be easy for a crew of wild people to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh... I can, we can make the frames and get ready and just give them the dimension and the, all the drawing. Yeah. If they can, uh, if they want to do it later on, okay, they can do it in other workshop or they, if they have a, a high level of technical uh, uh, mastery, okay, they can cut them, uh, cut it themselves. Yeah. Okay. But uh, there is another issue also. It's about how to amount and assemble it. This is the issue. Yeah. You have to feel it. That's right. Um, I'm saying that's not not going to be completely easy for people. Uh, you have to test it on some novices to see how they do and see what the what the trouble spots are. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, you have to do that because without that, I mean, we're gonna. Um, I mean, are we playing planning two days for the workshop or one for for the build? Uh, actually, in, in in each place, it's two days. Two days. Okay. One for the building, <laughs> okay. uh, other one with remaining parts and, uh, okay. and uh, explaining how much can do. But well, uh, the one that's very hard. Right, right. If you have if you have two days, then the whole first day you can spend building the frame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, next thing is, do you have CAD for that? Did you free CAD it up yet? No, I didn't free CAD. I, I used the, the, the old free CAD as it is. Okay? Uh -huh. uh, so I didn't change it. Before I was able to, to change it, that's why I asked you about the CAD. Uh -huh. But finally, I decided to use our CAD, so there's no changes in the CAD. Only the, the changes in the dimension of the frame itself uh, and the holes. Right. Where I can uh, put the holes in the frame. And I'll, I'll, that's why I'll, uh, later on I'll make, after uh, total assembling, mm -hmm. I'll make the new dimensions for the holes, especially. Okay. Okay, well, that's that's very good. Okay, so what do we need to answer for you regarding the the printer to go forward? So the software, you're not connecting to it? Uh, I actually downloaded the last version of Linux uh, from two days ago, and I tried to configure it, uh, uh, and I opened Cura. Yeah. Trying to connect. It's connecting. After that, closed. I don't know why. Okay. So this is from the OSC, OSC Linux on the OSC Linux page, correct? Yeah, it's uh -huh. totally Linux from OSC Linux. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe. Um, the new one. Okay. Which is in October, I think it's released, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have to resolve that. So, so one way is to to use that, and and reportedly Christian said that everything worked there. So that's interesting. But the other, only other option you have right now is to download the individual software, like Cura and Marlin, the, from our website. Does Have you tried that yet? I already downloaded the Linux, and it shows already the Marlin, which is there, right. and the Cura is there. Right. Uh, and also, there was uh, everything. <laughs> Even the Arduino 1.7.8 right. Right. was also there. Uh, but uh, the same thing is uh, when I open Marlene in uh, before I was open Marlene, it's open in Arduino environment. Right. But now when I open Marlene, it, it it's not uh, applying the Arduino. I don't know why. It looks like uh, uh, not Arduino, like uh, uh, like a word sheet or something like that. Okay. Tell you what, why don't you uh, let's? I mean, let's troubleshoot it. I mean that that should all work. Christian has tested it you might be doing some step wrong i mean so would you be able to then yeah. what you can do can you when you do it show me the screen just basically capture screenshots put them on your log 
and we say, okay, I did oh. this, and then it crashed, or whatever, whatever it did, we got to troubleshoot it, because it should all be working. So then, just, okay. yeah, just send that over, okay. as soon as you you got it, take a look at it, we'll immediately tell you what's what's wrong with it, and then we can troubleshoot it. Okay. Good. Yeah. I'll do that uh, back tomorrow, inshallah. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. So after uh, after getting the software up and everything, I mean, you've got the do you have the print bed on your machine there? You got the heated bed. Yeah. Yes. It's and the wire. There. And the wiring is. But I didn't. No, no, no. I didn't connect it until now. I'm not from connecting and uh, just trying something uh, because I'm I'm not uh, I'm worried about the shield itself. Okay. The shield chip. Uh. Okay. So. Well, let's keep it safe until we see. The situation. Okay, so the next thing you need to do is, is do the wiring? Yeah. So what questions do I you have on that? Uh, already, I, I, in Windows, yep. I have some body from, uh, which is already have uh, the bright up. Uh, he has uh, a lot of uh, 3D printers there. And he come with me and he tried to modify it in Windows. And there is already the, the, the motors that uh, are moved. All the motors are moved, okay? But we didn't test the printer because uh, the alignment and the magnetic was not so efficient and uh, it was not applicable. But when I, uh, I go to them, uh, which is I need to run it on Linux as per our standard, just to keep our in one line, uh, as I say. And uh, it's a quick configure, but later on, I'll take the snapshot, as you say, and uh, and uh, I'll show you what is the situation exactly. Okay. Uh, and the other, and the other thing is, did you understand the part about all the belt, like the belt, the way the belt is facing, and where the motors are? They have to be exactly as in a D three D geometry as I yeah, showed you. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'll take uh, the photo from the also. Okay. So what else do we need to cover uh, right now? Uh, yes, uh, the screw itself. How I can uh, assemble? Uh, okay, the screw that. Uh, Okay, I can put it on the place, and so already magnet, uh, connected with magnetic with the 3D printer, but uh, it's still not tight. How are tight well, that? okay, so you've got the bolts, the axes are connected with bolts to the frame, and the X is connected to the Y with bolts, correct? Yeah. So what what is the issue? The, 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 the extruder itself. Yeah, the extruder itself. That should be with you How use... Yeah, so that the idea of, of magnets there is a good idea in case you crash into the bed, the, the head will pop off instead of destroying destroying your bed. So that is a good idea. And yes, okay, I agree. So yeah, it's but, not staying, it's not working for you. Uh, it's working, but uh, I'll show you something one moment. Roberto, in the meantime, would you mind uh, opening up FreeCAD and showing your updates, like when we get to you, Roberto? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Yep. Here is the extruder. Yep. Okay. It's totally assembled. Yep. Like that. Still moving on the box itself. Okay, so you gotta put. Yeah. How you are make sure from this not will not uh, will come out. And, right. Uh, so there's the six bolt holes on the uh, on the sides. So the M6 yeah. screws they go right in those and you can lock it down. The the holes. Sure. The, the bolts go in there. Yep. Uh, yeah, I see it. Yep. So take one of the six. bolts. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Okay. 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 There you go. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, there's a number of bolt holes you can use to make it. Yeah, they, they work well. That we didn't have problems with that. Yeah. And you print it out of PLA. Yeah. And you have a double Z axis, so you have two Z axes. No. Uh, in, in in our printer. Yeah. No, we have double you have Y one, axis. Double Y. Okay, so the recommendation is for. Yeah, if we do this, you do want to do double Z-axis. So, can you print yourself another Z-axis? Because the idea there is, 
over time the the bed will start to sag especially if you're printing at higher temperatures the plastic piece will end up giving away a little bit so it's gonna be more robust if you do two two z axes uh, so on an 8 inch it's not critical but now we've moved to 12 inch versions and there it's absolutely critical because you just can't support it on one one side you do want to like I would actually recommend do it on two sides because that way it'll never get out of alignment on a tilt like right now after some time it goes out of alignment on a tilt and you have to screw down the Z the the bed again just adjust it a little bit so I would recommend it. it's not I mean it's not absolutely critical but I do recommend it right now because you want people to have a better user experience you don't want them to say oh it you know it worked and then it got misaligned after you know a week or something so okay. yeah so that means more work so instead of uh, you know instead of using four now we're going to five um, to five of the axes which is all right I mean the cost per axis is under fifty dollars um, it's probably like I don't know what the bill of materials cost I think it's like thirty dollars or something per axis so that will be the extra cost involved but it does make a better better machine which also means that instead of an 8 inch bed you can upgrade it to a 12 inch bed as well if you use this size frame because a 12 inch bed would also fit into inside that frame and right now we're just starting with 8 inches as a simple entry level so it's upgradable if you do it from two sides if you support it from two sides it'll also be upgradable to the larger 12 inch version you see yeah yeah, so it's I definitely would recommend it. it's it's not bad to do. It's it's all you need is there's two Z connections on a on a board already because most of the printers have two Z axes. Uh the the normal Prusa printers have that. So it's already set up for that. All you need to do is plug it in and make sure that they're going in the right direction. They're mirror images, so you have to remember that. So the way you plug it in it has to consider that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So in other words, if you're going to have like if you're looking at the machine and you've got the Z axis, if the belt plug is on the one hand side on one, it'll also be on the same side on the other Z axis. That's because they're already mirror images. So a mirror image typically you'd have to on a mirror image you have to put the belt in. Well, if they were identical, um, if they were, I, I take that back. So you have to. I think the way it works is because they're mirror images. When you flip one around, the peg should actually be on the opposite side. Sorry about that. I think the the way it works is one peg, one belt peg is on one side, and on the other side the belt peg is on the other side so that they both move up and down together but you'll see that and you can you can test that readily now the good thing about the direction of motion you can just reverse the plug on the controller board and it will move the opposite direction I believe that's true yes. yeah okay. so it's it's relatively oh, simple so, oh. yeah uh, the, sensor. Uh, the sensor for the extruder okay uh, is it needed uh, to make uh, Tom guide, as you say, to put uh, the 10 k ohm uh, resistor and the 50 k ohm uh, resistor for the cycle, or uh, or it can pass without it. Are you talking you about know, the Z probe? The sensor itself. The sensor no, is you don't. To the no, you don't need any of that if you've got the correct sensor. The 5 volt sensor does not need that. All you need to do is wire it up. Um, I mean, there should be comments. In, uh, okay, on a D3D Marlin page, right? Uh, yeah. That should be explained there. Uh, the wiring diagram, the working dock on the D3D Marlin page, so look, go to D3D Marlin, right? 
you've got the working dock in there and in it on page no that's not the right document that's you might be looking at that one so um, let's see Marlin so let's see D3D on a D3D page the controller No, no. Okay, okay Marlene. Working document? Yeah, it would be under, I believe, D3D controller. Yes, go. don't go to D3D Marlin, go to D3D controller. And on that page, page two shows the wiring. And that wiring document on slide number five shows you all you need to do that's all you need to do there's no other resistors because those resistors were there for if you used a 12 volt probe instead of a 5 volt probe so do you see that document it's the wiring document uh, no. no i tried to find the page but it's not existing okay me. let me so send you a <clears throat> yeah so so the direct link to the wiring of the probe is I'm putting it in the dock in a in a chat window. Yeah. So Okay. So that should be right there. Okay, so that's that's the working. Say it again. Say it. issues is over. Okay. I'm not sure what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Okay. I find what I was saying about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Oh, that that should be all you need. That's pretty easy there. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. And also, okay, do we have a note taker for this time around though, uh, just as far as there's uh, Roberto and Abe on, can one of you guys take notes as well, just to, as you guys see the Saudi Arabia event is currently scheduled for about mid-February, uh, did you guys, um, are you holding that date still as tentative or are you you're actually putting it on a calendar? No, it's a calendar issue for us. Okay. Okay, we decided. It's 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 uh, after the survey. It's decided. Uh, it's not uh, it's not our decision. So it's, it have to be in the middle of. It. Uh huh. Who's whose decision does it is it on the when the students have the uh, schedule? It's, yeah, students and uh, some of uh, the engineers in the university. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, a group, uh, it's uh, a big group uh, survey. Okay. Uh, and, it's, uh, and there are the people who are, uh, who are uh, you can say, uh, uh, they are, uh, I can say, uh, they are care about this one. Okay, so they, just, uh, they are the people who will work already on the workshop, will Excellent. be with us. So, uh, but how many persons? Uh, I don't know how we can co communicate this as they have uh, about uh, your coming and uh, who would be with you. Uh, yeah, I would like to have uh, one person who the original one of the original developers come with me to to assist on that. Uh, would that work for you? Yeah. Okay. No problem. But they will have to give uh, to give us. Uh, you know the legal uh, papers before the time to create a visa and blah blah. Uh, and later on, they have will talk to you about this one. Yeah. Uh, to arrange the whole papers. Yep. Okay, that sounds good. So yeah, let's let's uh, 
talk about that and put that on a calendar and that will be then the first first OSC collaboration workshop for 2018 that's good that'll be a hopefully a good start for the year <laughs> oh, <shall I? laughs> okay. yeah yeah no but but then let's talk about the schedule for this week I mean so when are you aiming to so you're gonna make these connections happen when are you aiming to have the finished product actually show some prints yeah finished product inshallah if i if i can get the bus tomorrow and connect it maybe a friday okay you've got all the wiring and everything um yes, that you need there. okay everything so with the with the working document there that i just linked to you and the wiring diagram i mean you think that's pretty clear to you yeah okay it's it's something it's like exactly what i have did uh the only problem with the configuration, which is uh, when I make it tomorrow, I okay. we need uh, when the, 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 the test. Uh, of course, you maybe you pass on something like that, and uh, you can find the solution quickly. Uh, so it will run. Okay. Uh, I hope. Okay. So email. So yeah. So you're gonna take screenshots and post that to your log, right? Yeah. At least I know. Oh, okay. And okay. I hope you can answer, and then so send it via email to be uh, to be also notized from your side. Okay, so I'm just emailing Christian. Ahmed is testing the Marlin Cura on the OSC Linux. Will troubleshoot? Yeah. So I just. Uh, I'll, I just sent you that email so you can include him so so that if there's any changes we need to make to the OSC uh, Linux we still believe that's gonna be the easiest way to make the workshop work because then then people just take the USB and they install they run it off their USB and that's worked relatively well in the last workshop we've had a success rate I think it was about 70 or 80 percent success rate of people who just took the USB drive this was during the the brick press workshop and about 80 percent of the people were able to run run the linux successfully or a couple of people who could not access their boot menu i think but it was just one of those things that you just basically have to show people okay this is how you access the boot menu you just have to press a key on a keyboard and then there's there's one of two things you have to do like in one on some systems you have to change a setting and in other systems it just works so we'll have to make sure we have that uh, but we'll tell people for the workshop either make sure you like before the workshop just download the software see if you can make it work that's one way and then we'll yeah, have the backup the way, uh, yeah uh, for your experience from your experience yeah how many flash uh, have to be ready to download uh, for for example, 400 person. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you want to have one for everyone. You need one for everyone. What? what? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's pretty. So it's pretty I'm... quick. It's like. Um. I mean, if you do it on your own computer, it takes like it takes me like 30 minutes or 20 minutes maybe yeah, to yeah. make a uh -huh. USB drive. Yeah. So. It takes half an hour with me. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have to. We'd have to do that. Yeah. I, I would have one for every single person so that. Once people get to that stage, it's not like I'm, I'm waiting for a disk because I don't have one. No, like we should be able to do it in parallel, so everyone should have one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'll, definitely. I'll try to manage this amount of uh, flash memory. Yeah. Okay. So but we... I have to test it all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so basically, it's, it means that we'll just ask people to download the software for, for the workshop, and some people who are... So, you know who taken it I mean mostly it's that people just before the workshop they're too busy and they don't do it that's that's what happens so I mean that's that's okay. been the history you ask people in an email they sign up for the workshop you tell them to download the software and they don't they just come to the workshop without doing anything so uh, but some people will there's gonna be you know maybe you know 25 percent or maybe 50 percent that you know, if you emphasize that, you know, maybe you could get like 50% to download download it before the workshop, and then for the rest of the people. I can make a workshop before the workshop, just to download the, the Linux. Yeah. Time. Okay. Yeah. 
yeah get the people stuff. yeah get all your people to help out just make make a bunch of bunch of usbs um okay. yeah yeah but that that would be good so that and then you can have perhaps a few computers i don't know if you have a couple of extra computers that for people that don't have uh, a working laptop with them uh, or it doesn't work and uh, you just have an extra we or two. have a lot of community uh, issues for this and we are uh, doing uh, uh, a good stuff in that don't you worry in this issue exactly uh, you will see what we'll do yeah yeah more than you think okay so the next step is to download uh sorry to to take the screenshots of where exactly the ose linux is failing in your case and it should be something something you probably don't have some kind of a setting right so yeah just we'll troubleshoot it so send us those pictures as the next step screenshots of where exactly it, it's failing and you're able to do that within uh, ose linux right you have to but you can't save it on ose linux what you have to do is upload it or send yourself an email from ose linux Make sure you got email working, and then just send those screenshots. Because if you turn off OSC Linux, it's—I don't think it yeah. saves. It saves anything. So, okay, sir. yeah. So you make sure you just email yourself or put it on a wiki or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, excellent, excellent. So that will be. Uh, I'm glad you've got your machine to the state of completion that it's that it's at. Take some pictures. I mean, show the work. Put it on your log. And okay. uh, we'll troubleshoot it. Okay, excellent. So we'll move on to the so next. Is so is that it or anything else? No, for me it's over. Okay, excellent. So we'll wait for you on, on feedback on troubleshooting the software. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And if also the, the, the free cut. Or I'll just wait for the free cut offer confirmation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can if you if you're not doing anything, there's plenty of work you can do on a free cut just to update the frame. Just I mean, there's a lot of detail with those little corners and notches and the rivets. I mean, all those details should go into the final final CAD once you stabilize the method. Like, are you pretty secure on a, the exact p procedure? Or are you still working things out on how to assemble the frame? No, it's uh, for me. It's like uh, a visual kick. Okay. So for you it's easy. So what you should do is you should put that into CAD so that people can follow exactly that procedure if it's yeah. the optimized okay. procedure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you've got plenty plenty to do there. Great. Okay, excellent, excellent. So look forward to progress on that. Just sh troubleshooting and seeing the first prints there. All right. <clears throat> so let's move on to the tractor. So we're working on a big tractor. So Roberto, can you share your screen maybe with us and we can look at the latest iteration of the tractor where we're at on that? Uh, because essentially uh, we'd, we've done a pretty good job on the micro track and I still have yet to do, um, basically do some of that in terms of uh, running it, tr doing a lot of trench. We were actually gonna use that to trench a lot of uh, cable into the ground here. But on a big tractor, we're as soon as we've got that design and we can really talk about a workshop next year which will probably be i mean the earliest would be like mark around march time next year but we want to because it's called here right now but february march um more like march if, if february is saudi arabia events for a build I, I would think about around march time for the build of the big tractor so you've got plenty of time to really perfect the design uh, but make sure that all happens. Uh, so Roberto, let let let's see your screen. See where we are on the on the design. Okay, let me see. Yep. Uh, so yeah, it's coming along well. I think. I mean, you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, so um, I, I don't know if the um, the the motor is or my my main um, yeah doubt. Yeah. Oh, this yeah, is yeah. the is the the elbow the, the right. elbow. Uh, I I look for the the dimensions and well I I think it's it's correct but. Uh, I'm not sure really. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm seeing there is that detail that we need a lot of space for that elbow fitting there. 
And, uh, you know, now that I think about it, what if we were to just punch a hole in that metal? Because what I'm seeing is that there's a, you need about at least one inch on each side, making that whole tensioner assembly so big like that, which makes it harder to keep it aligned vertically. You'd want, yeah. Uh, what do you think of that? I think maybe we should just uh, torch a hole there. That's that calls. Yeah, that that was my my first approach. Yeah. But I I'm, I was not sure about the um, the space for uh, for the thread of the elbow. Through right. The, through through that hole. Uh, because the elbow is now is now in night. 90 degrees right. respect to the the motor. So when you turn the the, the elbow, it, it can touch with the with the plate of the tensioner. Right, right. If we do the if we do this strategy of, of making a hole, then we probably it will be definitely much easier to do a a straight fitting there, so that we don't have to the elbow. I mean, basically the elbow starts pointing back at the metal creating interference. Um, were you able to find a straight fitting like that? I'm sure we, we could do that, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Do you have a link for one of those fittings? Um, Let's see. Not, not now, but... I, I'm You've sure seen that, one. That I'm sure, I'm sure we, we'll have one. Well, in fact, I mean, we have... Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we did was we used an elbow there that was an NPT elbow, so from the initial it's called British pipe thread. That motor has a British pipe thread, BSP. It's called BSPP or whatever. Um, so it, yes. the initial fitting is just a straight fitting. So into that we just go with a straight one, another straight NPT into that one, and that's how we solve it. So I I would say let's do that. That would make it much easier. I think it's much easier to torch a hole there than to make that whole assembly so much bigger to accommodate the the plumbing inside of that structure yeah right okay but in if the if the if we use a straight um, feeding there is it not going to to touch the the power cube then or okay so that's yeah that'll be the second thing to to figure out um, so let's see um, let's see if you're yeah yeah that's an issue. Um, is it possible to face the fittings downwards, the, the top fittings downwards? Well, it's, that's not convenient for us, but we could reverse that motor so that the fittings are actually pointing down, uh, down towards the tracks. And that way, would that work or no? Um, yes, but there's that, that has to be for only one motor. So, yeah. because the... I, I, I think that they are identical, or the motors, or they are. Yes, different. they're. Yeah, they're identical. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're, then, then we, we can uh, um, put uh, or ret rotate one one of the motor the motors, so the fitting is going to be to the front. Yeah. Side. Right, and for the power cube. It's also true, what if we, um, you know, what if we arrange the power cube such that the power cube has a space there so it's not hitting anything inside the power cube, though? That might be a, the other option we could, when we put in the power cube, we'll use one master power cube and three small ones, right? And the small ones have primarily the frame, so there's likely to be space. Remember how we talked about that the master power cube has to be on top so that there is no, no priming problems? So say like if you look at my screen, I'm, let me share my screen here. Um, let's see. I'll uh, share my screen. Okay. So on my screen, which I'm also recording here. So this top upper right or upper left power cube would have to be the the master power cube with a hydraulic tank 
and the other ones would be the small ones. So we can in principle, yeah, like now that I think, I mean, we have to, that's where we have to design the real thing. So put in the real larger power cube and that larger power cube is now going to have to be longer than 30 inches because we're going to have a wider reservoir. And I was thinking um, instead of a six inch reservoir, we probably might want to go up to eight inches if we're talking about four power cubes. So eight inches long for the reservoir. And the other thing that's much larger is the fan. The fan itself is correct in the existing bill of materials for life track it's the larger I believe it's called 1284 the Hayden 1284 cooler that is gonna determine the t the top dimension of the power cube because once again we need to fit that cooler within the dimensions of the frame so uh, I remember the dimensions of that are 24 inches uh, I think we're at that particular fan Cool, rather cooler uh, if you go to a life track version 1710 the bill of materials um, no I think we got to go to micro track version 1710 we have a bill of materials there no life track construction set 2017 that's where the master bill of materials is um, Uh, where's our BOM here? Um, no, it was, sorry, it was, we were working with that in the power cube version 17.10 as far as the dimensions of the cooler. So, is that in there? Okay, Hayden 1284 cooler on a power cube version 1710 BOM and the dimensions there are Oh, it doesn't say that right there. Let's see, does it? No, it does say it. Overall height is about 17 inches and width is 24 inches. So we're going to need 24 inches at least for the cooler and we probably have to face it to the side since the the exits yeah we'll have to fit that cooler into into the new power cube but if you consider 24 inches for the cooler and at least 8 inches for the reservoir we are at 32 inches already so the the task is basically to design the bigger power cube around that that cooler does that make sense Roberto it's gonna be a little bigger yeah Yep. Yeah. so what I would suggest is possibly then the geometry might be maybe we put the power cube instead of going two two going backwards maybe go with one going side to side and the three other ones are below that because the other ones are only going to be, I think we got them down to like 15 inches. Uh, six, seven, eight. Yeah, yeah. So we probably can put up to four of the smaller power cubes on the bottom. So we can possibly even open up that space where we have the conflict uh, with the motor fitting. We can open up that space and move the recess, the power cube away from that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was trying to to arrange uh, more of those uh, small power power cubes. Yeah. And I and I'm, I I find some conflicts with the because the I mean the the pump is yeah outside the frame, so yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not sure if the if if the, there are going to be conflicts with with those pumps. Right. Yeah. 
No, that's part of the considerations we have to work out because if the pump is sticking out slightly uh, outside the frame, yeah. I mean, whether we use elbows or straights at the pump, we have to make it work. So that's the CAD work that needs to be done. We need to figure out how we get up to four power cubes on the back of that and, and all that space. Um, so yeah, we might have to end up with, like we have it right now, where there's four of them facing forward and backwards. And then one of them, the master one, is going to be a bit longer. So we'll have to... I, I guess what, what you'd want to do is is just take a power cube, power cube file where you look at the locations of the fittings and see how you can arrange four power cubes to actually work in that basic geometry. Mm -hmm. The way we probably, yeah, will do this is we might have either all the four power cubes fitting it, fitting into one circuit but possibly using modularity we might have to use two circuits because if we use two circuits we can stay with 25 gallon per minute valves if we use pump them all into one circuit we'll need to go to a 45 gallon per minute valve and those are more expensive and not as readily available so it's actually lower cost to go with two 25 gallon per minute systems like for example one 125 gallon per minute for one of the tracks and another one for the the other side so it's it's a possibility to, to stay with just 25 gallon per minute valves uh, in the hydraulic design here but we have to look at the details of what makes most sense for scalability and modularity and ease of build altogether so that it doesn't become too expensive the disadvantage of going to the much larger parts is that larger parts are non-linear non-linearly expensive typically that's that's the trouble with them and they're harder to work with once you get to one inch hoses which is what the 45 gallons per minute take it's just so much harder it's so much harder to screw them down and to make them fit that parts actually get really heavy too um, when you get to 45 gallon per minute valves they everything just becomes a little heavier and more hard to work with so it's very convenient if we could retain this as a 25 gallon a modular system, 25 gallon per minute valve system. So, um, yeah. And as far as the where are we at on the cab width and the like, the cylinder mounting is that looking good? And the and the height of the dump. You didn't get there yet. Sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. How far are we? What's the status on? Because we were aiming for. I believe 99 inches for the dump height based on a Bobcat T300 standard which is what it gets we were looking for a very nice high reach of the loader arms um, is the pathway to that pretty clear or does it mean major revision because I think one way to do it is to raise the loader arms a little bit as you mentioned yes uh, that, that's one option and, and the other option is to enlarge the, the arms. Yeah. Uh, meaning so, longer and and with yeah, an attachment point. Or the, yeah. And or moving the, the the shaft backward backwards. Yes, that's correct. What if we just do you know the tri the tri the angle tubing piece? What if we attach the loader arms to that so that you can have a farther back attachment point? Have you considered that option? Um, mm, not really. But, okay. Uh, but you you say uh, to attach the the arms to that um, forty five degrees yeah. tube. Yes. Yes. And in fact, we can make uh, the tube. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we can make the tube geometry such that right now the tube is sloping backwards. What if the tu there's a we move the vertical post to the very back of the tractor, which is typically how the bobcats are arranged. They have the attachment of the loader very far back on the machine. We can do something like that and rearrange the geometry so that the slanted tube is facing forward, like sloping down forward, not sloping down backward. Like it'll be just uh pivoted 90 degrees 
basically the vertical bar would have to be all the way at the back that means the supporting triangulation would, would face forward does that make sense and what about the tensioner there yeah uh, the tensioner would have to, we have to I mean still right we'd have to have a mechanism where we attach attach the tensioner somehow so we can possibly retain that shaft and then put yeah I mean possibly retain yeah um, that's an issue so either an extra support at the very back we'd have to just add it or something or attach the loader arms to the the backward slanted piece to the slanted piece yeah so we have to rework the geometry uh, so yeah there's a lot of uh, trial and error here or kind of thinking about what what would get us the best answer and I think the best way to do it maybe just model that within the sketcher like look at the um, use the sketcher so that you can constrain some things and then see the rotation how far the, the motion goes up uh, so like like Josh was talking about one time where you you can do the modeling of the uh, basically the range of motion analysis you can model that within the sketcher of FreeCAD um, does that part make sense about modeling it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, for the cylinders, I usually use uh, the sketcher. Yeah. To measure the 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 shape of the arms and, and the position for the holes. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, uh, what are your next steps? Are you um, are you working on a three D printer or primarily this? Yeah, I, I was working on the the tractor. And okay. For the printer, I I think I'm I'm I can start uh, to to uh, build the the frame, and then I w I will try to to put the the axis and, and all the the other things. Yep, and you have the two Z axes, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah, you should. Uh, I'm not sure really. How 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 are how how are the the Z axis? Yeah, one just basically adding one one opposite of the one that's already we're used to, you know. They, so they have some some difference. Uh, no. Respect to the the other axis. No, there's no difference. It's just a second mounting point, so that you never have to mess with the bed sagging. What happens is if you print PLA, uh, it works. When you go to ABS and you raise the temperature, the actual heat of the heat bed starts softening up the mounting piece and it tends to warp down. So you can't, without the second Z axis, ABS printing is very hard to do. In other words, or anything that requires higher temperatures, the, the axis starts to sag at that point. For PLA, I've been, I mean, I, I ran this one machine here without any modification or any adjustment to the Z axis, the one that had one support point. I ran it for a few months here without a problem, but once you go to, to higher temperatures, it starts to sag. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have those parts. <clears throat> I sent, <clears throat> I sent those to you there. So yeah, you can, you can do that. But please, um, like I was going to ask you, please start a separate log for that, like, or, or, or just keep it on your log, like, do like a sub log, like D3D Chile log or something like that, where you just go through the whole assembly so that, uh, I mean, it's a good record for, for anyone doing this in the future. Like, say you get a part kit, you know, how do you put it together again? Yeah, can you do that? Yeah, Roberto, can you take a, can you start us, hmm, let's see. Yeah, sorry, Roberto, um, I'm asking, can you start a separate log or just a very clear log of the, 
the D3D assembly so that people who receive the kit they can be fully instructed of how to put it back together? Sorry, I, I missed your last minute of... Yeah, I'm asking, uh, please start a separate log for how you're assembling the 3D printer so that that's clearly documented for anyone doing that in the future. I mean, we really don't have like a okay. complete uh, set of pictures for how the machine goes together. Uh, we need to generate that still. Okay. That'll be good. And you know what? I think we're going to have to come down to Chile and do a workshop there in Santiago. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Well, I have a TED fellow friend who's in Chile, uh, who's, uh, I believe, in Santiago, so uh, I can connect, reach out back there. But yeah, I think I think we should put that on a calendar. Uh, since you're a, you're a serious, dedicated developer, we, we, need to, uh, we need to get you doing workshops. I'd like to see if you can... I mean... The bottom line is, it's like, it's it's a good thing to do. It's it's really, um, it's a good experience. I I want to see if uh, we can make it happen down there. That'll be good. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So so let's let's talk about that. And because because basically right now I'm I'm gonna try to put the the whole schedule for next year uh, by like by end of winter by like January. And we already know we've got February, Saudi Arabia, March is we're looking like um, exploring the, the Costa Rica opportunity, but that looks like that's happening. Um, we've got a build of the brick press in June. I want to see if we can build the tractor probably like April. That would look like April for the tractor, the big tractor. So I want to basically fill up the schedule for next year to know exactly what we're doing. And then we can have a heads up for everybody such that when we, whenever we announce a workshop, people have a lot of time. As I mentioned, someone mentioned Paul, Paul from Permacult Permis. He said, advertise six to eight months before you host an event so people can plan, plan a vacation time if it's a big workshop. So we'll do that. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to get the schedule up uh, by January. And I'll be working on that. So, um, depending on how you do on that, I mean, let's let's really consider what would, what a feasible date would would look like, and and how we can make that happen. That's good. Uh, okay, next. Um, so on the tractor, then um, let's see. I think it looks like you got your work work cut out. So work next maybe on um, on what the. I mean, you finish up the yeah the tensioner which is good I like the the idea that it's symmetrical on both sides in other words it's straddling the motor is on the sides not on the the motor is not in front or behind it's right on the sides which means it's easier to pull up without torquing the the tensioner assembly that's good it does mean that we are putting the arms a little closer in which is I think that's acceptable uh, given this design consideration of, of the effective tensioning, which is which is perhaps, you know one of the hardest mechanisms on this machine, like in terms of complexity, we worked out the tracks, everything is working, uh, but the tensioning part, yeah, um, that's the only challenge left to prove on this larger machine, really. So I, I do like that. Uh, so yeah, let's torch out those holes and make make a straight fitting happen, and then we can work on the power cubes um, and the little bit of additional loader height and in the brief discussion we've had so far we're modeling the the arm height on the Bobcat T300 which is a nine nine ninety nine inch dump height meaning the bottom of the bottom of the bucket lifts 99 inches high that's that's over eight feet high for a very effective loading capacity um, just just to you know re reiterate the loader did you know that I put the loader as one of the 50 Global Village construction set tools? Is that crazy? Well, all, all of anything like from mining, all the material extractions happens with some kind of a loader, loader activity. Uh, so a loader is actually very, very important. Uh, it's just, just one note on a Global Village construction set. Even though it's a very simple thing, it's a critical tool of in infrastructure for civilization in the sense that 
any physical reality from logging like forestry like you build houses you you have rocks or metals or anything um, that's pretty much extracted with loaders that's that that if you take rocks out of the ground you typically do explosives and then you do a loader but the loader is a very important part of a um, of human infrastructure so so to get an effective loader we master the tooth bar the removable tooth bar that's excellent we've I think we've mastered the geometry in the last build uh, and now to get the very large height on this present build is a is gonna be a good milestone to make a really highly functional machine that takes this to pretty much a good product release um, which we're very very close to and I think we're pretty much at product release with the micro track it's I think that's I think that that machine there is uh, really good at this point okay let's move on to Abe. Abe do you have any um, any reporting? Tipping capacity is going to be the limit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a question. Yeah. So, I'm trying to estimate some of that. Uh, it looks like the arms can be adjusted in a few different ways to uh, effectively get it to that 90, 99 inches there almost, I guess. But uh, it might have to be a combination of things to get that full extension. And I yep. think like that. Bobcat design is interesting because of the, like, the vertical lift and all that, but that, that adds a lot of complexity having to do uh, other complex compound uh, movement points. Yeah. So We just got to nail it. Go to the Skechers simulations and yeah, uh, for the load load lifting capacity definitely would, would require counterweights because our tractor by itself is relatively light. Uh, it's pretty much space frame construction, a lot of empty space. Yeah, I guess keeping the, the weight, if you keep the center of gravity down, that's going to be important. Uh, raise, raising the arm point there several inches doesn't look like it's going to give them a lot of height. And right. Back, uh, back is probably the answer. Uh, Right. And that when you move it back, the issue that exists then is that the shaft, the power cubes interfere with the, if you were to poke a shaft through this. So that's a definite issue, in which case one option is that the, the loader arm, basically the mounts, do not go further than the they don't go they're not it's a not one shaft connected through it have to be two separate shafts which is doable it's not as desirable because it makes makes this thing less stable um, if you're not connecting through through the whole body the mounting point is much less stable so it would have to be reinforced there significantly um, right now I'm not seeing a way like unless we make the so let's see am I still sharing my screen here no let me share my screen again so what I would suggest for now is to test the idea of maybe just retain this vertical here but what if we just put a vertical another vertical up here 
simply dedicated to the loader arm mounting. Um, so keep the bar where it is so that we have the tensioner mount point. Put another bar vertical pretty much at the back of the tractor and that's where the new loader arm will attach and therefore the power cubes are still able to be put in there and uh, the the bar does not interfere with the power cubes because it's behind them and then we still would have the triangulation reinforcement so that um, the arms the verticals are supported properly as they need to be so I would say step number one would be let's take the vertical mounted way at the back and just make it work there um, and then uh, possibly this the triangular support would have to go towards the forward because then it would be in the way of the loader arm so does that sound like a good approach you know one thing I'm trying to figure is I figure this like this large bucket Plus, I know soil, a cubic yard of soil, I think weighs well over a ton. But obviously, every time we make the bucket and the arms heavier, that affects that tipping point. So, um, I mean, we want to hit that 99 inches, but... Well, no, that's I, fine. I that mean, they're just... Angles to the... If we put the angle braces towards the front, that, that probably is better for the power cubes and everything there, it looks like. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the solution—I mean, the solution to your issue is we—we're not going to get away with with uh, without counterweights. I mean, this is—you can see how light this machine yeah. is. There's going to be counterweights on the back, so that'll be what okay. will allow you to lift the heavy loads. Because the cylinder, the loader arms—they're going to have many thousands of pounds of strength. That's not going to be the issue. Uh, it's going to be yeah. the tipping tipping of this machine. Which which we've already seen. I mean, when when we put the 1,600 pound brick press on the current tractor, Life Track Six that we use, uh, there's we've got about maybe 700 or so pounds of counterweight on the very very back, just a bunch of plates. But yeah, we can definitely do that here. We we'd put a a counterweight on the back for for any se serious work lifting things. And, and that's what bobcats typically yep. do have. They have a lot of they have a lot of them do have counterweights do in the back too. Do those power cubes weigh? Um, no, they're how much? No, they're pretty light. I mean, with the very light frame like we're doing right now, they're the one we have right now. The the one for the current one is only like three hundred pounds. It's not a lot. And that's for the one with the re reservoir. The ones without the reservoir are more like 250 or 200. So, yeah, so not yeah, a lot of weight there. Like, yeah, extend some kind of frame on the back for counterweights. I know an easy way to make that adjustable is put a frame and, and use water barrels, but even that may not be heavy enough. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we can put um, lowest cost way to do it is is uh, concrete weights. Water, it's, you require a watertight container, which is not as easy, or metal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but let's we don't have to worry about that so much right now. I think that's because we have the box beam tubing frame. What we did last time was we took a lot of the plates, the hull plates, which each of them are what is it like 20 pounds or 25 pounds of plate uh, for the 8 8 by 16 plates about 20 pounds or so 20 25 we put a bunch of those on and that gets you a lot of weight very quickly um, like 10 of those 10 of those 20 30 of those well yeah I mean steel is, is at a, a dollar a pound so it, steel is kind of expensive to to make weights out of if you put like a thousand pounds you know that's a thousand dollars so concrete yeah. is a is a ready solution for this kind of uh, um, application or if we get yeah, some cheap scrap metal like there's still there's still going to be some more weight uh, well actually i was wondering too before was how much reinforcement stuff we're going to need underneath yet because there are not a lot of it well there are no attachment plates uh underneath for the axes 
axles and so on. Uh, so there might be some pretty heavy stuff under there yet, hopefully. So not so much. Does, the plates are really, not really a lot. Light, right? Yeah, I mean, what you see there is relatively complete. The only thing that's missing is the there's the mounting plates, but those are only like 25 pounds each. The the plates that are half inch plates that mount the the shafts they're not they're not too big, but uh, only half inch. Yeah, yeah, we've been using half okay. inch for the plates that mount the the shafts, and that those are pretty pretty good so far. I think they they could do for. We might have to double them up, possibly, but uh, in this case. Um, but um, I would say so. The next step would be let's let's try um, to parallel up this work. I would say let's try to get. Uh, so first of all, is the tensioner update, and then the fitting of the four power cubes. What's the geometry that allows everything to fit? Because we 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 have to, yeah play with that to make sure everything works properly but then maybe you can work on um, maybe move the loader arm mount to the back and that means pretty much thorough rework of the loader arm geometry uh, but of course we've got this version already which is I mean at this point we've got 80 inches I, I'm calculating about 80 inches uh, possibly like 80 80 few inches so we can test the the arm going all the way to the back or we can test the simpler thing which is mounting of the loader arm where you mount the arm on the triangular triangular piece here you know what maybe maybe we could do it in two phases like what's the disadvantage of using an yeah if we still retain uh, Martin? yeah go ahead yep can we put the 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 shaft for the arms uh, above above the power cubes? The, the power cubes, yeah. Yeah, because that's a possibility. It's close to that position. And yeah. It would, I think that would solve the the problem of of having two uh, shafts. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right there. Um, let's see. So how high are we already? One, two, three, four. Yeah. Yeah, I think why not? Maybe uh, we can then. That would be one way to do it. Um. Let's see. What's our current height up to the? How sure are we 40, about the power cube size relative to those placeholders? Now I, I knew there was a bunch of variations on those power cubes. Yeah, but they're not going to have to be taller vertically. They're going to be different, not in height, because 20 inches is fine for the height. Um, well, not really, actually. With a bigger fan, I can tell you right now that one of the power cubes is going to have to be taller. That's true. No, you're right. Um, uh, before that on one of the cube designs the fan had to be put on the outside top, yeah that yeah that's correct? because that's correct so we right. we've learned that we're gonna need about 22 inches for the big power cube but the other one could be okay the small power cube is fine at 20 height um, yeah no, I mean this means you know examining a few options here. Let's see um, to go above. That's a doable thing, uh, which means that the higher above, that I mean the more unstable it is in the lifted arm position. But you're not driving around with lifted arms. You're driving around with lowered ar lowered arms, so it's safe. Um, I think it would be pretty much acceptable to lift to go a few inches higher there. Um, so that's one option. The the simplest to execute is to put to keep the the shaft as is, which is there. And um, uh, 
when let me just show you one thing so if you go to metal by the foot for example how much is that shaft costing us and I believe it's about um, my estimation is about thirty dollars a foot it's not super cheap it's not that but too expensive either so if you go to metal by the foot you go to steel you go to round solid um, hot rolled steel or whichever thickness available size 3 inch what do we got 1, 10, 12 no they don't have it let's see 10, 18 3 inch okay here we go 3 inch shaft um, for 12 inches get price $33 yep that's exactly right so cold rolled round solid bar is th about $33 it's $34 a foot so that shaft arm there it's about one two three four about five or six feet that's costing about hundred fifty dollars for a shaft overall in the overall price of the machine that's not bad but if we keep that bar there and use just simple um, shaft stubs to hang the loader arms that's a way to do it or you can even do where yeah no that's that's the easiest way to do it if we put a stub going out then you can attach that there but it will be torquing on that it'll be torquing on that vertical bar so you probably would want to put another vertical bar right below that so that you have a stiff attachment for the the shaft uh, I mean that's one way to do it and uh, Martin? yeah yep yeah if, if we if we are going to have um, uh, another verticals uh, behind the um, the power cubes, yeah, the 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 middle vertical can be cut about just um, above the tensioner, and then you can move the the, the, the front. Uh, I mean the the power cubes that are mm -hmm. above to yeah. to uh, forward. Is that possible? Forward, let's see. The tensioner bar has yeah, to be Yeah, tensioner bar could be lowered. Well, I mean the tensioner vertical support would be in a way, no? Yeah. But but, uh, but the power cube could be moved forward if it's a single power cube on the back, single upper power cube. Here's a single upper power cube could be moved forward. Okay, the, the, the difficulty with the mounting all the way to the back is just the sheer length of those loader, loader arms. It, it just gets really long. Uh, what about if we uh, yeah. do... Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the trouble thing for, that I see immediately here. What if we did uh, space between the power cubes so that there's a three inch gap between this, the power cubes that would be doable and then the shaft goes all the way through I, I would really like to have that shaft all the way through because it's just a cantilevered arrangement of that shaft that's just not good design because uh, you need extra reinforcement there um, what about if we do that send a send the shaft through in between the two, two layers of the power cubes I cannot imagine what you're saying. Okay, is, is, let me uh, uh, going through the power cube or or placing the power the power cubes in a different play in a different. Position. Yeah, so so keep the lower power cube where it is and raise the top power cube such that you open up a space in between the power cubes and put the shaft through that space. Does that make sense? Say you say um, so. Um, 
Cut in the frame of the power cube? Or no, not that's sure. not that. So let's duplicate this one slide. So so live track. That would lower. Right, it would lower. Point by one. Well, we can raise the bottom power cubes too if we like. Okay, but let's see this. Uh, so I'm drawing it on page five of the working document. So okay. the idea was put the shaft through there. You see it? It looks yeah. like that would lower the shaft or the arm uh, yeah. height by 40, 40 inches or so. Well, we, how about we do yeah. this? So we still yeah, get a decent... To, to reach uh, the, the 99 inches uh, for the bucket. When yeah. dump, dumping in the raised position, that would be would, would need a, a a longer arm because you are lowering the the shaft. Um, yeah, height. you do. That's correct. But we can still do that if the cylinder is some something like this. I think that's still okay. I mean, you can move this. You know, you got this longer arm, right? I mean, that would still work, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I just did a measurement. Um, I'm just moving a cube around in front of the raised bucket and to measure off of, and, and lowering it 40 inches, it, it gives um, 102 inches on that diagonal versus like 92. So it, it it's 10 inches longer. I mean. The other way we could do is, this is where it goes back into the arrangement of the power cubes. I think, Roberto, it's important to figure out the geometry of the power cubes, because what if we did this, where the long, the, the large, this is the mother, daughter power cubes, what if the mother power cube is side to side, and the daughter ones, so we don't have to raise, I mean, you want to keep it low for center of gravity. What if we did that? Um, and there's three, three daughter ones over here. That's, that's a possible configuration. What do you think of that? So then still keep the, ver the tensioner, let's keep the tensioner where it is, but we can lower that bar a little bit. So the tensioner would still be here. And then we'd have to do you know, maybe we, we do a piece like that here. That'll be our, okay. yeah, something like that, so that we're, you know, we have an attachment point. You know, what about something like that? Uh, then you got this yeah. awkward space here, but that's acceptable, I think. Yeah, the, the point here is, uh, I mean, the, if you're lowering the shaft and, and moving backwards at the same time, yeah. In order the 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 arm can reach a higher uh, position. Yeah. Um, the 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 distance that you move the the shaft backwards have to has to be uh, gr greater or higher than the distance that you are lowering the shaft. Or you can do what I'm showing here, or you can do this. You can put the cylinder closer here. Yeah, I mean, you you can uh, move the, the the arm higher with, with the changing the position of the cylinder, but uh, I mean that also, uh, what matters is, is in what position is the bucket going to be? Yes. Because if it's too too back, uh, it's not uh, it's not useful. I I think it has to be in a in a similar position that the, when the the, the 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 arm is lower or or not. Um, I mean, I, I refer. I'm referring to the yeah, to the distance respect to the cap 
Yes, yes. It has to be in. The only requirement is it has to be in front of the cab. So, so the, so the idea is. Um, yeah. No, you're right. But right now, can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, um, right now. No, no. The, the geometry is quite good here for dumping height, it's in front of you, but the, the dumping could be back by about two feet, like as long as it's in front of the cab, you're pretty much pulling up right up to the thing you're dumping into and then you're dropping in front of you. So the dumping could go backwards, the bucket, you see what I'm saying? It could move backwards about two feet and still have a... a dumping where you're not dumping on top of the cab you're dumping in front of the cab right oh yeah yeah but 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 that will reduce the the the, the the height the height of the bucket and even if you if you want to reach the 99 uh, inches um well i mean not really look at look at what i just drew on if you uh, the will you Look at look at um, so look at page page five again. See how I mean that looks not bad, right? Um, or or is that bad? So it'd be like like this, huh? And then um, um, yeah, we have to yeah, yeah. I think that that could work. Uh, if uh, maybe we can uh, establish um, a proper distance between the bucket, the the, uh, the, the distance between the, um, the riser bucket and the cap, what what do you do you think is is appropriate? Um, two inches. I mean, all you got to do is it's in front of the the cab. Any distance in front of the cab. Okay. Like in a fully fully lowered position, it could be right in front of the cab, like like right there. Well, it has to be in front of the tracks and in front of the cab. But right now, the cab is in front of the tracks, so all it needs to be... Uh, so to be accurate here, the tracks are back. So this would be sufficient. I mean, you're pulling up to a... Well, because when you're dumping, yeah. like... Yeah, I mean, just... Two inches, six inches, you know. Four, four inches. Yeah, Let's say four I, I, inches. Yeah. Like this. Yeah, I think that the the, the main um, deal it, uh, there is is how to get the that ang angle with the bucket using the. Oh the yeah. Oh yeah. Because mm. it usually we can yeah can conflict can have a conflict with the with the pin. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You are right about um, that. I, 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 I was seeing the 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 T three hundred. Yeah. And I, I noted that the distance between the the two pins, I mean the pin of the of the core cylinder and the arm and, and the arm, uh, is is closer. It seems to be closer than than the the, the current configuration that we have. And, and and that of course can allow a, a higher range for the angle of the bucket if the that distance that distance is is closer. Which distance is you closer? I understand that. Um, the, the closer the pins in the in the mounting plate for the bucket for the male quick attach. Ah, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how how closer? How much closer? I'm not sure. I think because we're maybe relatively five inches. I, huh. I, I'm not sure, but just seeing the, the images, I yeah. can imagine something like that. Because I, I, I also uh, I also have, have I have that conclusion because I see a, a a greater range for movement for packet in the in those machines. I agree. And I imagine the only way to to to, to get those th that range is having a, a closer uh, distance between th this, those two points. Right. Because they, 
even they they can uh, curl the the bucket a lot when 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 it's in the lower position. So yeah. So look at page six, page six now. That would be definitely an an you know that would definitely get you a, an answer. Something like, well, kind of copy the more of the bobcat what they do, but that would get us good height, right? I mean, you can even let's see how. Yeah, and <laughs> let's see. And, and and maybe even with the current configuration for the arms, we can get the 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 proper uh, height or height. But the um, I think the the only probably the only conflict would be the the curl cylinder, right? and if we can we can put the or angle the the bucket as much as you you show in the in the um, slide five. And yeah, I think we, we can get that that position with the current configuration for the arms. Uh, by doing what? The, by 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 making the the main cylinder attachment further up the arm. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, I mean, mm. moving the the that the cylinder attachment to the frame um, will forward, so it's not going to 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 conflict with the tensioner or the or the shaft. Uh huh. You mean um, here in slide five in red instead of um, so the red instead of the black. That's what you mean. Um. Well, it it will depend of the of the geometry and. and I think that that would be. It has to be modeled in in the sketcher. I I, I cannot uh, say yes. where is where is going to be the position. But I just uh, considering the, the 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 position for the of the bucket because that I think that's the main uh, conflict or or the right. pot potential potential conflict. Right. Between the. The curved cylinder and the and the P in that um, holds the the bucket to the to the arm. Right, or we would have to, oh. yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Then maybe we can, yeah, for those upper male quick attach attachment point, it would have to maybe come out forward a little bit to get a better angle. Yeah, because I see your point. Um, in fact, we've got experience with messing that up when that angle was too shallow and we actually bent the curl cylinder pit, a pin, uh, the rod. We actually damaged the cylinder because it went out too far and um, the rod bent, the rod of the cylinder bent. So yes, that's a danger point there. That's a really unstable point, really hard point on a cylinder. But if we move those, you know how the bottom attachment on the male sticks out? We could possibly make the top point stick out a little more to, to make that geometry better. You think? Yeah, I, I see in the, um, the bobcat, I think, um, that the, 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 the curl cylinder is, um, is assembled uh, in, the, in the bottom hole. Not in the in the upper hole, and the and the the arm is. Um, do you want to do that? To the to the upper hole. Do you want to do that? I I don't know. I mean, maybe that uh, could be easier to solve the the problem, but I, I'm not sure really. But I think that it can can be a good idea because the. The angle is is more. I think it's more critical in the rise position than in the lower position. Correct. Yeah. 
So it's going if the the core cylinder um, is attached to the to the lower hole in the rest position, I think that that can be more stable there or, or more easy to to move. Right. But yeah, I, I think that, that I can can do some tests with the sketcher and, and see what happens. Yeah, okay. Now the if the cylinder is attached to the bottom, is there going to be, do we need the open arms? Because we were hoping to go with the tubular arms, not the open arms. But we can do, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we can do either. Yeah. I mean, we can do the open, you know what I'm saying? Open arms versus tubular arms. I think that instead of having two plates, just having the the whole tube. Yeah. Okay. And you could still yeah. fit the cylinder using doing that. Um. Well. Yeah, I think it depends on the position of the holes. If we can put the, I mean, in the lower position. If we can put the the hole in a in a place such the the cylinder is not uh, in conflict with the arm, I think that it's possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, because also the the bucket in the in the the back um, plate of the bucket is not in the angle that you have in the in the image. It's, it's in a it's an angle to the front. So I I think that could be possible. Yeah. And in the in the right position, I think that is 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 it's not going to be a conflict there because yeah, you you are you are not uh, touching the n n n on our hmm. um, the the arm there. Um. Yeah. So. So you're saying that use the current configuration, but also raise the the cylinder attachment a little bit, or no? Uh, and, and not not really raise, because if yeah. we can if we can, uh, put the the bucket closer to the cap, I think that maybe we can reach the 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 height that that we want. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I will be um, making so, some tests and and I, I can email you if, if something is not good or, or if I need more. Yeah. Uh, another idea or. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like it could work. Yeah. So we're we're kind of going back to the drawing board, reconfiguring how the loader arms attach to the. Bobcat quick attach. That's a major. That's a diff big change, and then we'll see if it works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. That looks like an interesting way to do it. I mean, you end up uh, reducing the height of the arms and just lengthening them. Well, the vertical height, vertically shorter. But yeah, I can see how that would get the bucket closed. And yeah, the cylinders underneath there, it's kind of hard to visualize that, but that, that does seem like it would work okay. Um, and it might actually get more length uh, overall for, for the height. Yeah. Even if the, uh, the shaft is back behind with the power cubes, it's it's more similar actually probably to the bobcat in some ways because their mount height is fairly low right and the arms are just longer yeah yeah and if yeah so see what you can do on that and then I mean what I would still say is um, try that as the first step but I would say go right to the the idea of recessing the mother cube backwards 
so we can have the mount point further backwards. Don't be afraid to do that, like on slide number five. Um, let's do that. So first is the remount, the, the way the male quick attach is mounted. Second, move it back, move the loader arm backwards if you have to, like on slide five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the minimum, well, I don't know about the minimum, but I know you were talking about before, obviously four power cubes, but I think last time you also mentioned the potential of a fifth power cube for a total of 80 horsepower, maybe. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know where. Oh, no, it's just, you know, just thinking about on the back. Yeah. I mean that the bottom line there is first we have to draw up the mother cube and we already have the baby cubes so we can we can work with those but uh, after we draw up the mother cube we'll see how many we can fit I mean of course we can strap on <laughs> extra power cubes as we want to and it would be good for counterweight <laughs> so we can just keep building a platform to the back and adding more power cubes if we like that would be good counterweight too um, but yeah. yeah don't worry about that for now I'm just I was just saying that it would be possible to do that if we needed to. Yeah. Um, okay. So how do we divide this? So, so Roberto, you got the tensioner, maybe do, do the geometry of the new mounting. Uh, Abe, maybe you can do the bigger power cube. Uh, start working on that explicitly because we're, you know, we're guessing okay. until we actually draw up the exact way the power cube looks. And did you get the conversation about Hayden 1284? Uh, yeah, I think I heard some of that, and I'll review uh, what the dimensions need to be. It yeah, does seem like, obviously we keep getting a lot of different versions of these power cubes, but I guess that's that's okay. Well, we're stabilizing for, down to... Yeah, I mean, we, we started with uh, single single one and it, it's okay with the construction set approach I mean uh, for the the brick press we just needed the smallest cooler so we used that and and then it worked well for the micro track we wanted the second the next larger up and then for the big tractor we need the big big cooler so that's just how it goes but for the the baby cubes they're all the same because they don't have the they don't have the cooler and and reservoir so let's see yeah i think we were talking before in a meeting about the electrical uh i assume is this mother cube does it have a battery and all that with some type of alternator or i know there right. were issues before okay, with the larger okay. fans on things with electrical power because the the non-electric start motors uh, which are 50 dollars cheaper only provide two amps right yeah but it's the same for both um uh, both of them the on all these power cubes, on all these types of engines, the charging current is only two or three amps. So actually one good suggestion that we had during the workshop was there's the air, there's the actual fan on the motor, which is by the pull cord, and that that blows significantly. So the suggestion okay. was put the, put the cooler right in front of that so you don't need a fan. And that's actually yeah, a good I idea. Think, so... I think Josh somebody mentioned that before just have the intake cool it yep. I, I wasn't sure how much airflow or cooling the hydraulics actually needs in a right higher temperature environment yeah uh, I would say that probably in a if you're running 64 horsepower that probably may not work it would probably work for one or two power cubes quite well um, but for larger it wouldn't so what do we do here well um, For this, one of the big difference for this larger mother cube is getting the fan, the bigger fan in there, and everything. That was one of the major issues with that power cube, right? Not having to mount it on top. Right. Well, that's why we'd have to increase the size, and we. I mean, I would say that for the micro track, we can consider the the cooler in front of the air intake, which has significant blow. So I would do that, but for here, 
that just wouldn't work for all six for all four power cubes at once um, unless we put a cooler on each of the power cubes which is another way to go um, but the thing that I said to myself was well let's just use a solar solar panel and I think that's a preferred route because if we have GPS automation we can make this an autonomous tractor as well this could be a this could be doing certain functions like for example uh, yeah pulling tractors of various things like chicken tractors or pig tractors or whatever or doing like slow work across the field so as I said even a small panel would let you do that like 300 watt panel you uh, the calculations there were you'd move about a thousand feet in a day uh, but but still with a lot of strength so I would say that because we have access to GPS automation which we're working on and the meeting by the way is tonight at 8 p.m. we're continuing those meetings uh, given that we can definitely consider the the solar panel that that charges a battery so that because we don't have enough charge current um, now between all the power cubes there's four of them so you got eight amps well actually you know that's another interesting thing if we have eight amps between all the four power cubes that's enough for a one big fan actually so maybe um, maybe that's acceptable in itself yeah wiring up the you create a wiring bus and of course that creates a bunch of complicated connects yeah. between the cubes but that's just the way it is anyway yeah I mean a wiring a bus too, yeah so. it's not not too complicated it would be a simple single plug that you're plugging in so for example we could use something like like trailer plugs one of those four four plug trail four connector trailer plugs and you just connect to the mother power cube and that's the only you know you've got the hydraulics and then you got the one electrical connections that would be acceptable uh, the question being is are those two amps times four are we really gonna get eight amps and is there gonna be enough to run a fan uh, we hope so because yeah. those fans should be uh, and then there's, able I think you said before that the solenoids pull a bit too Obviously, well we don't have Arduino, any solenoids here if it's push-button controls to the Arduino or automated RC a lot of that stuff doesn't pull much you know, milliamps, but uh, the well, solenoids, a, it sounded like. Well, in an automated version, you'd have to worry about the extra power for the solenoids, which could be, could be, you know, another three amps, so we'd be really cutting it short. But just without automation, if you have the fan, it's a non-automated case, and you got four power cubes times two amps, so you got eight amps. Now, that could, in principle, be okay enough. So maybe, maybe what we do for now is we examine that option as the first route to explore if it's sufficient to do one solid cooling fan on the master power cube and then if that doesn't do it we just have to go through the solar panel so I think that's how we should proceed because um, we might just have enough yeah. for for one one big I fan you don't need a very big solar panel but putting it on the cube actually I just think putting a panel on the cube wouldn't necessarily be the ideal place actually on top of the cab would be fine as long as nothing uh, damages yeah. it you could fit a bigger panel up there too maybe yeah yeah we can play with that but actually I would prefer knowing that if, you know if you're doing any rough work or forestry you're gonna damage your panel pretty quickly so it'll be better on the back um, or just stuff, you know, you lift something up and actually a rock falls off the back of the bucket uh, straight on your panel. That I could definitely see that happening. That that happens. Um, <clears throat> yeah, those so, panels are not too tough usually. Yeah, so definitely you'd need to protect it if you put it up there. But but I'd say we might just be good enough if we've got the four power cubes and a single fan. Let's let's see that. Let's see if that would work. Um, and then. Yeah, yeah, let's try that. Let's try that. And we know that, of course, in the cold environments, you can still run run that without any cooling. That would be, in the winter, you could probably run it without cooling. So I think first option would be see if those four power cubes add up to the necessary charging current. And then we could have, if they don't, if they're like very, very marginal, then we can still have just a tiny, tiny solar panel you know so that would be just for a few amps not even 
not 10 amps but you know 5 amps or something so that would be much more easy to do as well just have a small auxiliary solar panel and and why I got the big panel for the the brick press was because of the low cost of the large panels like the small panels actually are very expensive compared to the big panels that you get from sunelect.com where you could get them for 30 cents a watt in other words like a hundred dollars for a 300 watt panel it's crazy it's ridiculously cheap um, so a hundred bucks for a big panel I mean you can't you can hardly get a small panel for that you know um, yeah well that sounds good that sounds good so let's let's go with that so Abe, maybe you can take on the big power cube with the 1284 uh, and a fan, 12 inch fan, plus the 1284 cooler, and make it all fit. And so it's going to be larger than the current one. Uh, but otherwise, all the parts that we have there are pretty accurate and good. So we're good. You just have to uh, make sure that you put in um, the four suck, suck, sucklet, suckling po ports, uh, four suction ports, and uh, probably like two sets of return, two large return ports, and and two small return ports for case drains that's what I would do so two two large returns and two small returns and the filter and did you did you follow the discussion that the all the filtering oh yeah I don't think I mentioned this but uh, you don't have to send all the flow back through the filter you can send half the flow back through the fil filter and the other half directly back does that make sense because given uh, you know, you got with four power cubes, you got 40, 40 gallons per minute fluid flow. In other words, you're cycling the fluid, turning it over many times in an hour. So if you just let half the fluid go through the coolant, you don't need as big as a a uh, a filter and a cooler. In fact, when you no notice the specs of the 1284, it does not handle 40 gallons per minute. So you can send half the fluid through the cooler and half the fluid through direct to the back to the tank. Does that make sense? Think about that, but that's acceptable. Because you're still, because of so many turnarounds every minute, you got 40 gallons per minute and you got a, a 20 gallon reservoir. So every minute you're turning the fluid around the whole machine two times. In other words, that fluid's going to end up getting cooled because it passes so many times. If it misses the cooler one time, it, you know, on average, it, the cooler is still working. The, the critical part is, does the cool, cooler have enough heat rejection based on its specs? And yes, it does. If you look at the numbers for the 1284, that's sized for reje heat rejection of 64 horsepower engines. So that, that part is all good. Yeah. So so Abe, can you work on the the big power yeah, cube I'll and then? Do. Yeah, I'll read up on those power cubes. Um, I'm not sure I understand all the the hydraulic circuit flow, but uh, I'll I'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah, and ask me if you got questions. So that sounds good. And the last thing is we want to report on the uh, man. We just killed it with the hydronic cooler stuff. Hy hydronic heater. Eco home, eco home home. I started with this. Hold on a sec. But essentially, the hydronic system is working really well. So we've got the open source hydronic stove. Um, and here's how it looks. Here's the final system. That's pretty much close to how it looks final but basically using these manifolds that are very convenient um, and this is a very actually a complex system this system what you see here in the picture integrates the open source hydronic stove with with one inch pipe heat exchanger and we've tested it it gets out about twice as much heat as the existing hydronic stove we have that was off the shelf which was five thousand dollars this thing cost $500 for the stove materials, so major success on cost reduction and performance. So we got twice the performance at one one tenth the cost. Do the math. That's uh, that's good. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this system 
accommodates integration of hot water heating, biodigester heating, a purge system for cleaning it out for the winter, like when you're not using it, solar hot water heating from the hillbilly heater in the in the greenhouse of the Cedica home. And it has auxiliary hot water storage. And it runs the thermoelectric generator. Man, that is complexity. There's about 37. I, I counted, I, I started to measure complexity. And it, this says, you know, you got to really study this here. It's, it's actually quite complex. And you, we're not seeing the other auxiliary parts. This is just the main plumbing panel. Uh, but the idea is there's 37 different pieces that are working in synergy from the floor heat to hydronic heat to greenhouse heating to pond heating of the aquaponics to thermoelectric generation to solar power integration man this is just insane so this is here major success we tested it it was so good that we blew out a pipe actually yesterday we had a major blowout in a seed eco home um, we had the pipes exposed around the stove and the stove is so hot even on, on like you know a few pieces of fire would get so hot and the house gets too hot um, because the heat exchanger is very efficient but we blew out a pipe yesterday so we're gonna put insulation around the stove today so do that but anyway major success on that this is um, in process all the pieces here uh, the conclusion it's actually not so easy to do this because of leaks typically people uh, solder joint these things together but this is all pipe uh, pipe NPT pipe and o-rings and stuff so it was a little tricky to see all the leaks but yeah just Teflon tape plus paste did it and this is awesome so we got a major success on that and that's gonna be an excellent product once we get to rolling this out in a seed eco home but I'd just like to report that it was very good uh, positive results uh, even though we blew out the system because it was so good so the rough idea is it has about 16 square feet of heat exchange uh, in the form of 16 one inch pipes three feet long inside the stove um, and works excellent super hot uh, and very comfortable heat once again the hydronic heat being under the floor it makes a very comfortable kind of a heating system so that's the report for the hydronic stove we'll take more pictures and full documentations of this but the level of integration and in this is just insane if you look at the one of the Facebook posts I listed all the different connections that this actually has throughout the CD home so I'd like to pat ourselves on the back for a major, major success on that. And we're going to keep adding the other elements because just now we've got the hydronic heat uh, plus, uh, that's it, just the hydronic heat for the floor. But all the other elements are accounted for to be connected. And we'll be working on that, uh, rolling all those other things out. So that's it. Uh, so otherwise, good stuff happening. Uh, Saudi Arabia, we've got tractor work, Costa Rica, 3D printers, uh, great news on the, you know, as far as Open Circuit Institute, which is not fully rolled out yet, but between that, rolling that out with a 3D printer and a good collaboration sprouting with uh, Tech for Trade. I talked to, uh, talked to Matt there, and um, they are open sourcing the, the PET filament extruder fully. We're going to collaborate potentially on uh, Hero X. We haven't really talked about that yet, but we're going to collaborate as much as we can to open source their system fully so we can roll out both the Lyman filament extruder and the Tech for Trade. They call it Thunderhead, the Thunderhead extruder. Um, we're going to roll those out, so that's going to be documentation work for the future. And we're, we started considering, okay, what would a workshop of that look like? So Matt Rogi is his name. He's returning back to Seattle from Africa uh, at the end of this month. So we're going to plan on a workshop in Seattle or here in, in Missouri, building out the, the Thunderhead filament extruder as well. And that's, that's a great example of collaboration where we're building upon an existing project that's got that worked out. And we can piggyback off of that, where they also have the filament width sensor. So if you have crappy filament that you extruded and it's not really uniform, you still get perfect prints and you can look at the OSC Workshop's Facebook page for a sample print of that using the filament width sensor. So lots of good exciting stuff happening. Uh, I think that's it for today. Let's call it a day. Uh, you guys good then? If we're good to go? Yes. Uh, okay. 
Sounds good. We'll um, we'll continue the work. Email me if you got any questions and continue next week. Um, exciting stuff happening. So we'll talk soon and we'll see you later. Look forward to some exciting um, designs and the 3D printers in Chile and Saudi Arabia and everywhere else that we don't know about. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, guys, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.